All right. In the next couple of minutes, let's talk about the case scaling a startup. I have written the case, so I'm trying to help you reflecting the case. Hopefully you already have worked with the case or on the case either alone or with someone else. So what, what I would like to do in, like I said, the next couple of minutes is to guide you through the case and to reflect a little bit what has happened, what's going on there, and how could you make sense of that if you are faced with a similar situation. And like I said, I know the case, so probably that's a bit unfair compared to you just reading the case and having to make sense out of everything that is going on. But that also comes with a disadvantage. So I know the case, or I think I know the case. So everything that I will talk about right now is basically biased by the lens that I have when I discussed the case. And I've written it, I've experienced it. So I'm really excited to hear and read about your perspectives on the case. So again, the things that I'm going to tell you, the things that I'm trying to provide in this reflection are probably only a small fraction of what's going on in the case. And I absolutely invite you to work on that and to add whatever you think is, uh, is a good addition to that. Now, please take the case, make sure that you have it available either as a printed version or as uh, something that you have on your screen. All right, let's walk through the case from the top. And I think the first sentence already tells you that there is quite an issue. Daniel was considered a savior by some people in the company. And as it is said in the case, he was even hired with exact these words. And if you're being hired as a savior, that can be very risky. It can be very dangerous um, for a couple of reasons. One reason, for example, is that a lot of expectations are being loaded onto your shoulders. And the question for me is, can you stand the pressure of the organization? And can you do that? Overall, I would say it is pretty much, and I'm jumping to the end of the case right now, it's probably an impossible case to solve. There is no really good solution uh, to do that, especially not the three solutions that I will talk about a bit later on that Daniel is proposing. They just show me how desperate he is, but let's get back to that in a couple of minutes. So if you are hired as a savior, uh, there might be a lot of pressure being put onto your shoulders, that can be a risky thing. And at the same time, it can also be very risky because if people really believe that you save them, that you are a savior and that you really help them to get going again, it can probably lead to a regression of the other people in the organization because they think that you will fix it anyways, because this is because people hired you. So they regress, they become passive and don't do anything at all. So that's the second dangerous thing. The third dangerous thing when you are being called a savior probably is that some people in the organization try to prove that you are not a savior and that it was a mistake uh, to hire you. And that can be quite dangerous because in the best case, more or less best case, they are openly trying to work against you. So this is something that you can see and you can work with that. And that's pretty easy. And there are these three people, these three employees in the organization that I will talk about in a couple of minutes. They seem to work against Daniel. At least that is a hypothesis from my side that they're doing it. And it can also be that one owner is working against the other and just using Daniel as a proxy. And that's another issue we will um, talk about in a couple of minutes. So being hired as a savior, that is a very, very tricky thing. And let's think about other issues that probably are in the case. Like I said, the first one is that Daniel is considered to be a savior with all the pressure that comes with it, with all the regression that is quite likely, with all the potential attempts to uh, prove that he is not a savior and to prove that he will actually fail. 
Another reason uh, or another issue in the case is that Daniel seems to try to fix an issue in another department that he is not responsible for. And he's not re responsible for it, but it seems to me that he feels obliged by the other owner. And there are these t two owners, and that's another big problem in the case. And like I said, it might be possible. That's another working hypothesis from my side. I don't know, but it is a probability that the two owners use him as a proxy to fight with each other. So they're not fighting with each other directly, but instead they're trying to use him to manipulate him to do something in their favor, but their favor would be hurting the other owner. And that leads us to the next issue. The owners are so different. Uh, we have the younger owner who is trying to really make this fly, to really try to build the organization. Um, and the other owner, who is quite old compared to the first one, trying to see this as uh, like a pension scheme. And the problem here is that the first one, the, the younger owner, is trying to really build it. Luca, ex McKinsey guy, um, trying to make the company big. Maybe he's planning an exit. We don't know that. But Gerold definitely is totally different. Um, he's in his 60s, like I said, and he saw the company more like his insurance for a happy retirement. And that is something that you will see on the second uh, page. And the tricky thing is that they are so different and that Gerold is already trying to sell his shares. And that is a major problem because he probably has left the company mentally already and is not willing to invest anything here. And the problem is if you if we jump back to on the first page, there is um, a statement, a quote, besides a major legal change into holding structure, it is said, and the change overall is considered to be quite successful. And that is not true. It seems to be true that the change they have undergone so far is probably successful from a structural perspective, but there are really severe issues like the conflict between the owners, uh, that the one owner is leaving and these sort of things. And I just talked about two owners at the moment, but there is another issue, a, a huge issue, uh, and that we will see that later on. There are a couple of people who are also shareholders in the organization, especially the three. And we don't know if it's only five owners, so Luca and Gerold and the three. We neither know the name, we neither know the gender of these three people, and if there are probably more, but those three control roughly 50% of the share. So they are basically calling the shots as well. You cannot do anything if they agree to something. And the good thing, quote unquote, is that they often seem to disagree. And that is something that Daniel could use. I mean, that's a very political perspective and very manipulative perspective on that, but that could be one way to deal with the situation. That's something we can discuss later on. But in one case, they seem to agree, which is a tricky thing. It's hiring, it's firing the hired HR person. And that's something we will get back to. Another issue is still um, on the first page, I would say, is probably the history of Daniel. So where he was professionally raised. And as it is said in the case, he is experienced in a Fortune 500 company, which means the company is significantly bigger, and it is actually in, in the real world, than the one he's working right now, which leads to tricky ideas. Because if you look on the second page, um, he tried to implement process descriptions, standard operating procedures, policies, and all that stuff. They um, implemented a middle management. And Daniel also hired an HR professional to fill his own skill gap. He was not very good or he's not very good in HR-related topics. And he decided that her job was to implement standard operating procedures in HR, like feedback processes um, and professional recruiting and all these things that are important for, quote unquote, modern HR management, whatever that means in the particular case. And this woman, Louise, um, quite young, early 30s, 
And it is strange that it is mentioned that she is very, very attractive and that there are rumors that uh, I have a relationship with her, which is quite interesting uh, that this is mentioned so explicitly. And if you want to go wild with your fantasies and your hypothesis, uh, and that's a very wild guess, um, probably it is true that one of the three is envious about uh, the relationship or the assumed relationship, because actually there is none, but they probably assume they have the fantasy that there is one, that they are firing her uh, just to let her go because they can't stand that. Like I said, quite a wild fantasy. So let's skip that because we have no proof for that. But what we have proof for is that probably the person, role, task, and organization fit is not very good in this case because. Um, she also had experience in a global company, in a global organization. And Daniel's hope was, again, that she is probably the savior for HR, that she would implement standard HR practices and tools to support the business. But the business doesn't seem to appreciate that. And now Luca, one of the owners, the younger owner, told him that he has to fire her. And that's... A, also a tricky situation because also it's basically not possible to solve that in a way that we would be able to keep her. I don't know from a company perspective, and that's a fruitless discussion because it will not change the outcome that probably, at least from my point of view, you have to fire. So Daniel has to get rid of her, but let's get back to that in a couple of minutes. I'm wondering if the idea of professional HR and the standard operating procedures, training and development, and all these type of things are quite good. But I'm wondering if Daniel and also Louise have something in mind that is a perfect match for a large corporation, for a huge organization. But this is not what a smaller company like the company they are in right now is probably needing. So is the company where they both are in right now mature enough to benefit from this and is she the right person or should we get someone who is probably a bit more down to earth and who knows how to do hr in smaller companies and if you are in hr you probably know that the demands of smaller companies are usually quite limited i mean first and foremost is payroll and so forth and so on but don't let's um don't go too deep into that. I'm just wondering if she's the right person and if the task and her role is the right one for the organization. That's a big question mark for me. And she has to be fired, at least from Luca's point of view, because she made some decisions that were not very well received by some people. And that is a very vague statement from my point of view. So what are some decisions? What are some people? And what does it mean not to be well received? And when Daniel tries to poke him a little bit and tries to discuss what's going on here, he realizes that these some people were three long-standing employees who together are holding 50% of the company. And this is one of the issues I mentioned in, in the beginning. There are not just two owners, there are at least five owners and three of them, the three some people are holding 50% of the company which is obviously giving them a lot of power if they agree to a certain direction. And the next tricky thing here is that uh, their power doesn't match the formal structure of the organization. So Luca and Geralt, the owners, are standing in on top management level. So probably their power matches, um, matches their position, we don't know that yet because the three have 50%. So we can do the math. Probably Gerald and Luca have 25% uh, each, which is probably less than a single person of the three. But that's just, again, wild guesses and that won't lead anywhere. Fact is that three have a lot of power that is not matched by their position in the company. And I, I'm wondering why don't they have a hierarchical position in the organization that reflects their informal power that they hold or their formal power that they hold because of the shares that they have so that's a question mark that i have and for whatever reason those three who are in power and who are in charge demanded that louise the hr person is being fired 
for whatever reason, we don't know that uh, she made some decisions that were not well received. And when Daniel asks if he can comment that and if 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 uh, Luca could elaborate on what these type of decisions are, Luca seems to be annoyed and doesn't want to discuss that. So he just says, okay, look, it's like a dead horse, riding a dead horse, get over with it and get down. He just made the decision. And I think it's wrong. It's not he, Luca, who just made the decision. It's the three people who made the decision and told Luca to tell Daniel what he has to do. So that's a strange way of handling things, of working um, in these type of organizations. And um, so this reflects the power of the three, again, that they have. And it's, like I said, a very tricky thing because they have this much power that is not reflected in the formal position that they hold. So they are calling the shots and they told Luca to do it. And the next tricky thing that is happening here is that they not just told Luca to tell Daniel to fire Luis, the HR person. It is also quite annoying that the three are sidelining their direct manager. So every time they want to have a decision and probably they, they get a no from their manager. We don't know that if they eventually ask him or if they go to Luca directly, Luca helps them so to speak. He takes very fast decisions and that is their argument for going to Luca right away because decisions are getting quite fast. And I'm wondering if these three people and their direct manager are working in sales. It could be because um, Luca is deciding and he's deciding very, very fast. And by doing that, he's diminishing the power of the direct manager. He basically makes this person redundant because if no one is talking to him or her, why would she even exist? Maybe quite a drastic statement and there are reasons for the existence, but I'm wondering why is this person not being in charge and why is Luca sidelining this person? So is this person probably not, not good enough or doesn't Luca trust him or her or don't the people trust this person or do they want to consciously avoid this person? So there are a lot of things going on around this direct manager and the relationship between the employees, Luca, and the direct manager. And the problem here is when the three people are sidelining the direct manager, when they just skip talking to this person, then Luca takes a decision about certain terms that have to be tweaked into the system. Um, and usually these decisions create chaos because the standard operating procedures that were implemented to match the growth of the company, they are not a match to the decisions that Luca takes. So Luca seems to still take decisions as if this would be a very, very small company. And this is creating chaos for another peer of Daniel. So I'm wondering why is this peer not trying to fix that? Daniel somehow has to fix it because his boss, Gerold, is asking him to fix it. And that's a very strange thing for me because usually as Daniel, I would have told Gerold, look Gerold, I, I see the issue, I see the problem. It's probably a compliance problem and a, a process problem. I'm the CFO and I think that my colleague, my peer has to fix this. He or she has to talk to Luca and fix it. But for whatever reason, probably because um, um, Daniel thinks that he's obliged to support Gerold, who has hired him, that seems to be dynamic that is in play here as well, tries to fix that. But again, if he's doing that, he is being involved in the conflict. And it might be another wild fantasy that the three have a very good connection to Luca and that Gerold is trying to punish the three by asking Daniel to fix the issue that the three are going directly to Luca. So there are a lot of wild fantasies in this case, and there are a lot of issues, who is doing what, and uh, kind of a power play that comes into place, if there is such a thing as a power play. But it's very complex and very interwined, which 
with each other. So let's try to talk about the potential solutions. And Daniel seems to have identified the issue. The issue is that, from his point of view, that Luca has to change his mindset. And for me, if someone tells me, well, we have to change the mindset of the people, we have to change the mindset of the leadership team, we have to change the mindset of whoever, I'm getting really skeptical about that. Honestly, because how do you want to change the mindset of a person? And how can you even say that you are allowed to change the mindset? What is the mindset? Probably as a consultant, someone will tell you and someone will show you, okay, this is a growth mindset. That's a term that you often hear. But I mean, this guy, Luca, is one of the owners and he seems to be very, very convinced about his way of doing things. And the solutions quote unquote, that Daniel tries to propose are, from my point of view, not very good. Because Daniel tries to fix an issue by just thinking or pretending that it is a purely technical issue. And the solutions that he is proposing is to do a leadership training because he experienced a simulation himself one time and it literally changed his mind. So it was quite an interesting, impactful experience for him personally. And he's hoping that Luca has the same impactful experience when we would just replicate that. Of, of course, that's not going to happen. And there is a nice, um, a nice effect. Um, that uh, that that can be quoted here from uh, the theory and that is the cargo cult cargo cult is quite a nice story you can look it up um, i would suggest to do it on wikipedia because they have quite a good explanation the cargo cult was described during the times of war when people on islands were seen iron birds flying over them and those iron birds planes of course, were dropping things. And the inhabitants of the island would benefit from that. They would crave it. They would run through to whatever the planes dropped, the iron birds dropped and collected it. And that was quite fancy stuff sometimes. And when the war was over, suddenly these iron birds disappeared and the people thought, okay, what why is that happening? Why did they disappear? We want to get them back. And they tried to build runways to attract these iron birds because it seemed like those runways would attract them because they would constantly land on them. And that didn't work. So they started to build towers to attract them. They even started to build models of planes and put them on the runways to attract birds with other birds. So this is the cargo cult. And obviously that didn't work. And there are two other theories that come into play, especially when he talks about coaching and trying to fix the mindset by doing something. And that is called the golden fantasy. It's a regressive reaction where you think with the golden fantasy, people think that there is a high expectation about tools. It's usually coming from psychoanalysis when the patient thinks that or the client thinks that the therapist can do some, something just by applying a more or less simple tools. So that is the golden fantasy, fantasy that something will just magically disappear with a tool. And the last theoretical framework that I would invite you to dig a little bit deeper into, it's not very complicated, it's just quite nice to know, probably something that is more kind of a metaphor. It's the so-called law of the instrument. And there are various authors for this concept. And it basically says that um, if you only have one tool at hand, like a hammer, um, you want to apply to everything. So he knows the simulation, he knows coaching, and he probably knows um, experts who can fix things, which are basically three tools in his favor. And so he thinks that if he has a hammer, everything basically looks like a nail and that will not solve your issue. That is, again, a golden fantasy. So there are a lot of things going on in this case, uh, I would say. And getting back to the three options, I think they are basically useless. So that the same effect 
that he had when he did the simulation will happen with Luca is extremely unlikely, I would say. I mean, he could try, but what is what's going on if if it doesn't? It's a lucky shot, I would say. And if you do the math, uh, it's not a very likely change that will happen. The second option is that he could bring in an expert. For me, again, it sounds a bit desperate, I would say, trying to find someone else who would fix his problems, trying to find another savior this time for him. Maybe he's, rep he's replicating uh, the system by looking for his own savior to do that. And to coach the three people, um, I would say it's also impossible unless they do not want that. So if they want that, if they want to be coached, probably that's a good thing, but it's not just coaching them, it's also coaching Luca, but it's quite unlikely, at least from my point of view, that Luca and that the three would agree to that. So overall, I would say it's quite a hopeless situation, but I mean, also a very interesting situation. And one option could be to simply leave the company but he has quite a good contract. He's not so dependent on that. That's information that is not in the case. So he's not going to do that. And uh, by the way, if he's able to fix it, it would do wonders for his learning. Leaving a company would mean that you don't learn and the company doesn't learn. So there is lose-lose on both sides. And if he can't lose that much by being fired or being unsuccessful, he can stay and try to fix it by working with the people, trying to, and I sincerely mean that in a positive way, manipulate the people. And in class, we will talk about manipulation and if this is a good thing or a bad thing. If he is capable of, of doing micropolitics and politics in general in the organization, probably he's able to convince the people that this is something, that, that he has an idea and they should follow him. But again, I'm raising questions if his ideas are the right ideas because he's coming from a totally different environment. And probably that's also the golden fantasy that if you hire someone from a Fortune 500 company, they will also make a Fortune 500 company out of your company, which is obviously not possible. So there are a couple of things that are difficult in this case. And this is, like I said in the beginning, just a glimpse of issues that I see, and it doesn't mean that these are the only issues, and it doesn't mean that these are the right issues. These are just issues that I see, and sometimes they're wild fantasies. And I'm very excited to read and hear about your ideas. If you agree, and especially where you disagree, that's going to be interesting.